Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Nice to see you, and Happy New Year. So we will uh, continue on with um, our cardiology echo. I'm flexing into this uh, this month's clinic a talk on EKGs. Well, it, I expect this to be a regular thing. I'm going to try and bring in some EKGs every month, and uh, in the absence of anyone submitting their own EKGs, um, which I highly encourage, um, I will just kind of hit some uh, general topics. So um, we'll start with ischemia today, um, but uh, I'm happy to uh, take input in anything that anybody wants to uh, see. Of course, we'll include. So, but I want to give a chance if anyone has any cases they'd like to submit or uh, patient care discussion that they'd like to review, I want to make sure that there's an opportunity for that. So, um, otherwise, the topics will be uh, EKGs and uh, management of systolic heart failure. So, uh, both pretty high yield things uh, if you have patients with the heart which is pretty much unanimous. <laughs> so, all right, so I'll start with the EKGs then. Um, and I wanted to just preface, and I'll try and probably do this every time with a reminder about my, there's various algorithms that you can use to address an EKG, but of course you should use some algorithm to make sure that you're not missing anything. So uh, my algorithm is rate, rhythm, axis, QRS axis, but there's other axes that can be considered as well. Intervals, PR, QRS, QT, and uh, chamber hypertrophy, left atrium, right atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle, and then ischemia last. Um, that's the first thing that's gonna catch your eye, so we will go with that. Again, talking about your general intervals that we had discussed. QRS to QRS is your RR interval, PP interval may be different if you're not in sinus rhythm or you have heart block, for example, et cetera. Um, your P wave axis can be different than your QRS axis as we previously talked about. So um, I'm gonna show a lot of ischemic EKGs today and related to that, we should review perfusion territories. So, um, your uh, LAD is in green. So the, so the way I conceptualize it and the way I tell this to patients is the mass of the heart is like a football. There's three main arteries that supply blood to it. One goes down the seams, two go around the sides. So going down the seams is the left anterior descending coronary artery, the LAD. Of course, it has branches, di diagonals, and septal perforators. Going around the left side is the circumflex, and the branches from that would be the obtuse marginals. That's pictured in pink. And going around the right side is the right coronary artery there, pictured in blue. And the branches of the right coronary artery going down the side are the acute marginals. And then in most people who are right dominant, the right coronary artery divides into the posterior descending and posterior lateral coronary arteries. So the perfusion territories um, would be pictured uh, um, color-coded on different views of an echocardiogram. So in a four-chamber view, for example, blue is the right coronary artery. Um, the LAD is going to supply the septum and apex, and the circumflex is the lateral wall. In a two-chamber view, the LAD is going to supply the apex and septum. The right coronary artery is going to be inferior and basal. The right coronary artery and or circumflex can be inferior and basal on a three-chamber view where the aorta is pictured so you're rotating a little bit more anteriorly so it's a more anterior to posterior cut. And the LAD is in green, um, again the septum and apex, so there you go with perfusion territories. So um, I'll start and I'll read uh, some and I'll give uh, maybe an EKG to Charmisa, um, and we'll kind of go from there. So the rate, so we do rate, rhythm, axis, intervals, hypertrophy, ischemia, 
rate is just under 100 beats per minute, probably closer to 80. Okay, you can count the QRSs to define that. Rhythm is sinus. There's P waves that are kind of hard to see, but you see it clearly in standard lead one. And if you go straight down, then you can follow it. And there's just a ditzel of a P going through the rhythm strip in standard two, right at the end of the T wave. Very hard to see, actually, I think. And again, in V1. So rhythm is sinus. QRS axis up in standard lead one, up in standard lead two, that's normal. Okay. Um, we can deal with access things if there are questions in the future um, and kind of go into that. Uh, intervals, the PR interval defined as normal less than 200 milliseconds or one big box. So this is first degree AV block because it is a little bit prolonged, just barely more than 200 milliseconds actually, but there's first degree AV block. Um, the QRS of course is wide and it's down going in V1 and up going in V5, V6, 1, and AVL. So that's consistent with the left bundle branch block. Hypertrophy, there's no real great validated criteria for hypertrophy with the left bundle branch block. Uh, that's left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, so, uh, you know, could this, could there be a little bit of LVH here? Maybe. But there's, again, the criteria sort of fall apart with the bundle branch block. Um, there's no right ventricular hypertrophy and there's no atrial hypertrophy. Um, so, uh, and then lastly, ischemic changes. So with the left bundle branch block, it's often said that you can't tell about ischemic changes, but there are a set of criteria called Scarbosa's criteria. And that tells you that if there is more than five millimeters of reciprocal ST elevation, because you expect some ST elevation with the left bundle branch block anteriorly in V1, 2, and 3. There's more than five, then that is diagnostic for an ST elevation myocardial infarction. So there is more than five here. So there's three criteria for Scarbosa, more than five millimeters of discordant change, any anterior uh, T wave inversion in V1 and V, V1 through two, V1, two and three, um, or any reciprocal depression in V1, two and three. So you expect to see reciprocal ST elevation anteriorly, one, two and three, reciprocal depression laterally, uh, V5, six, one and AVL. Um, here, AVL has an upright T, and that could be an ischemic change, but it should be in two contiguous leads. So this, so there is, you know, it's just about five millimeters in V3, and five millimeters for sure in V2. So, of course, if it was a new left bundle branch block, then uh, you, it could be ischemic. Not always is ischemic. So you have to take that into the context of the patient's symptoms. But if they're having chest pain and they have a new left bundle, then you have to um, activate them for ST elevation myocardial infarction and follow that pathway until you can rule them out for the same, typically by echo. So um, this patient was taken emergently to the cath lab. and. Um, this is a view, uh, this is a left anterior oblique caudal view, the so-called spider view because the arteries come out looking like a spider. So here's the left main coronary artery, OMs, and here's the left anterior descending, totally blocked off, as you can see right there. So that this was an anterior infarct, mid-LAD, uh, and there that is. So Charmisa, why don't you take us through this one? Okay, um, just a couple of disclaimers on when it comes to EKGs. Uh, first of all, you don't have to be an expert. Um, being in cardiology, as long as I have, I'm, I'm not an expert. Um, and the computer reading is not always correct. So a couple things, okay. All right, um, <clears throat> so as far as rates, looking at here, rate of about 70. 60 or so. Um, rhythm, looks like sinus rhythm. We have um, 
We have P waves that are clearly discernible. Um, every P is married to uh, QRS. We have sinus rhythm. Um, axis, we have upright. So we have a normal axis. Um, hypertrophies. P waves are not um, huge in um, the inferior leads. We don't have a biphasic P wave. So it looks like we don't have any atrial enlargement. Um, as far as hypertrophy, um, just eyeballing it, it doesn't appear that we have um, uh, hypertrophy. We have good um, QRS progression. Um, ischemia, we're looking for ST elevation, and we have that in uh, three contiguous leads. So this looks like uh, there's some inferior ischemia. Um, and then you have reciprocal changes here in the um, anterior lateral leads. So it looks like this is probably an inferior MI. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, inferior STEMI. So here's a picture of the uh, right coronary artery being opacified. And you can tell there's just a huge thrombus going all the way, oh, I changed that again, going all the way down. And it, if you look, you can see uh, some calcification of the posterior lateral and posterior descending coronary arteries, but of course there's no flow um, at that time. And so then after you perfuse, you can see that there's a huge posterior lateral and posterior descending coronary artery system of this right coronary artery. So that is an inferior ST elevation myocardial infarction. Pretty big one too. All right, so here we go again. Um, so P waves are upright in two and three. Uh, sinus rhythm, sorry, rate is uh, just under 100, probably about 85, maybe 90. Um, rhythm is sinus, as I was saying. Uh, axis, so upright in one, but down going in standard two. So the S is just a little deeper than the R, borderline left axis deviation. So it could be a fascicular block with a Q and ABL, uh, QR pattern and ABL, and an RS pattern and ABF, but we'll reserve judgment because there's definitely some ischemic changes on this EKG. Um, uh, rate, rhythm, axis, intervals, hypertrophy, um, so no atrial hypertrophy, no large P waves or tall P waves in standard two, uh, no tall deep or deep uh, P waves in V1, uh, so no atrial enlargement, uh, no left ventricular hypertrophy, no tall R's in V5, 6, deep S's in 3 or tall R's in AVL, um, uh, hypertrophy, and then ischemic changes. So huge anterior ST elevation here um, and that extends laterally. So you have a big anterior lateral ST elevation myocardial infarction. And again, when you're looking at a STEMI, it really helps to validate that it's true if there are reciprocal changes, which there definitely are inferiorly. So this is a big anterior lateral ST elevation myocardial infarction. And if you look here, you can again see this heavily on this uh, cardiac catheterization. Got the catheter in the left main coronary artery and the circumflex OM system there, a ramus there, or a high diagonal. Hard to, a little bit hard to tell from this view, but um, and then you see this very calcified left anterior descending coronary artery with an almost osteal um, occlusion. So. There you go, big anterior lateral ST elevation myocardial infarction. So those are, you know, I mean, there's a few cases of STEMIs that we've seen recently at our medical center. Um, so we actually deactivate a tremendous amount of ST elevation myocardial infarctions. This is a young man who came in with chest pain. Um, so uh, right here, is let's find one on the line there we go so 300 150 100 just under 100 uh beats per minute maybe 95 because it's about one box below um rhythm is uh so upright p's inferiorly 
and uh, and the P for every QRS, QRS for every P. Rhythm is sinus, axis is normal. Um, intervals, the QT interval should be less than half of the RR. It's right about on the line. So borderline prolonged QT interval, but not specifically. Um, the QRS duration does look a little bit prolonged. Um, 100 milliseconds would define a prolonged uh, QRS interval. Uh, and that would be the initiation of an intraventricular conduction delay with the bundle branch block being above 120 milliseconds. So um, it does look as though there could be an intraventricular conduction delay, um, but there's an alternative possibility for the QRS prolongation, which I'll get to, hypertrophy. So there's a very deep S in V2, um, technically, the criteria would be the S in V1 plus the R in V5 or V6 greater than 35, but um, many cardiologists, including myself, extend that to V2. And so you have a very deep S in V2 and a reasonably tall R in V5. So um, there appears to be left ventricular hypertrophy. And then to the ischemic changes, um, if you look in standard three, there is some ST depression and T wave inversion, and about a millimeter as well in AVF. So you'll see, notice that there's a Q in standard three, there's a Q in AVF, um, and so those, those, are, those Q waves exist. And then additionally, you have ST depression in standard, in uh, AVF and three, and maybe just a little bit in standard lead two, so you have some ST depression there, and you had definitely have, so for a man in V1, 2, and 3, to be an ST elevation myocardial infarction, you need more than two millimeters of ST changes, and you expect to see this sort of tombstone appearance to that ST elevation. So you have two millimeters in V2, but only at max one millimeter in V1, and not really any in V3. So additionally, there's you know reasonable size Q waves in V5 and 6. So how do we rec does a young guy, no risk factors, comes in with chest pain? I'll just tell you his troponins are negative. He's got borderline pathological Q waves in 3 and AVF, V5 and V6, ST depression inferiorly, and ST and none doesn't quite meet criteria ST elevation anteriorly. So this is all left ventricular hypertrophy with repolarization abnormality. So this masquerading, you know, as potential ischemic changes, but this is LVH with repol, and we see this a lot. Um, and you really have to be able to work through that in your mind as to whether you think that, um, that this could, in the right patient situation, represent ischemic changes. But, Almost always, if you see an EKG with this big voltage inferiorly, big deep S waves in V5, the deep S wave in V2, and or V1, um, R waves in V5 and 6, so LVH, and then these repolarization changes. So this is left ventricular hypertrophy with repolarization abnormality. Now, is this something you're going to see in an athlete? So often you can see this um, in an athlete. So I would go to V5 and V6. And if you see this, the, often the J point here, the, if you look at the P, the TP segment, this line right there, the J point is probably right on that segment. Oftentimes you'll see a little bit of more elevation in the J point at that, in that situation. That would be benign early repolarization abnormality, um, and that would often be what you would see. This, this appearance, to be honest, I mean, this could be an ischemic looking ST segment, um, but taking it into the context of the whole thing, not really. And often, inferiorly, you also see J-point elevation, so I think that's an excellent question, Trevor. Um, so, uh, maybe a little more inferior elevation might be consistent with an athlete's heart. Uh, but it could be, could be. So you just have to, I think this is a person definitely buys themselves an echocardiogram 
uh, to uh, adjudicate what exactly is going on. All right, so, um, oh, went back here. All right, so this is one that I came across, sort of classic EKG finding, and I'll move through it kind of quickly because there's really only one interesting thing here. Um, well, few interesting things here. So uh, rate is um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. 60 beats per minute, because it's a 10 second strip. Uh, rhythm is sinus, upright P's. Uh, axis and P's for every QRS, QRS for every P. Axis is normal. Intervals, um, the QT is, is less than half of the RR. Um, the QRS duration is borderline wide. Could be, you, you know, I couldn't fault you if you called it an, an intraventricular conduction delay. Um, uh, PR interval is under 200 milliseconds. Um, hypertrophy, deep S, but not a tall R, so it doesn't make 35 millimeters, so no uh, LVH. Uh, oftentimes I'll also use uh, S and V3 plus the one in AVL greater than 28 for a man, 20 for a woman. Um, and that's supposed to be the most sensitive criteria for LVH, but that's not there. So no, hyper, no chamber hypertrophy in the ventricle, no RVH. There is a prolonged, uh, the, the P wave is greater than 2.5 boxes. So that does look like left atrial enlargement. So there is some chamber hypertrophy there. Um, and ischemia, there's none, but what you'll notice is this little bump, little bump at the end of the uh, QRS complex. And that little bump sometimes masquerades as ST elevation, kind of going along with my theme of ST elevation for today, right? Uh, if you have, that's the theme of these EKGs is uh, ST elevation. Uh, ischemic ST elevation and non-ischemic ST elevation. So this patient came in with a core temperature around 90 degrees, found down, cold, hypothermic, and that little bump is called an Osborne wave or a J wave and accompanies hypothermia, often masquerading as an ST elevation myocardial infarction. So there you go, Osborne or J waves. Um, so. And then uh, the last one, um, if you want to maybe just uh, kind of, not a lot of stuff to comment on here, show me somebody. Uh, just eyeballing it, it's low voltage yeah. everywhere. Um, so rate is about 100. Um, looks like we have sinus rhythm. Um, P waves are so low voltage, it's unlikely that there's any uh, atrial hypertrophy. Um, same thing as far as um, uh, QRS, um, it doesn't look like we have LVH, um, ST elevation, um, axis is normal, um, uh, hypertrophy. I don't see any ST elevation, mostly I'm just seeing um, maybe a little bit of ST depression in um, four and five. Um, this looks like sinus rhythm with low voltage. Yeah, so low voltage defined as less than five uh, millivolts in the limb leads and less than 10 millivolts in the precordial leads. This is low voltage. It's totally outside of my theme of ST elevation. Um, but this is a lady who had uh, CML and uh, came in with that EKG. Here's the echocardiogram. And just to, again, orient, uh, this is a parasternal long axis view with the right ventricular outflow track there, the left ventricle there, obviously not high quality images. Um, the mitral valve there, the aortic valve there, the ascending aorta there. But what you see is as the heart beats, you see this invagination of the right ventricular outflow tract in association with what here and here is a large, pericardial effusion. So this is a pericardial effusion with tamponade physiology. So if you come down to the four chamber view, left ventricle, right ventricle, tricuspid valve, mitral valve, right, left atrium, and here you see a little bit of that effusion creeping in, 
You don't see the effusion very well around the sides because of the quality of the images. And sometimes people don't take good images because they may have large pendulous breasts or lung disease and so on and so forth, but nonetheless, you still have to read them. Um, but what you really see is that with respiratory, the respiratory cycle, you see this intraventricular septum get sucked in to the right ventricle. It's really getting pulled to the left side of the screen. And that exaggerated septal interdependence with respiration is what defines the physiological phenomenon of pulsus paradoxus. So when you inspire, you feel the RV, and if it's got nowhere to go, then when you expire, that interventricular septum will get sucked on over in there and uh, poorly fill the RV uh, and result in uh, pulsus paradoxus, an exaggerated respiratory variation of systolic blood pressure greater than 15 millimeters. And so, Dr. Klaus has a question. Oh, yeah. Hey, Evan. Good morning. I was wondering if we could just loop back to the rhythm. Yeah. Yes. Let's do that. Yep. So it's very hard to see the P waves, but they are upright in one and two. And the inferior leads, you can't see it hardly at all in three, but the axis is kind of funny there. And ABF. So P, 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 P. So we'll just march it, share, share, la P. So it's all upright and uh, QRS for each P, P for each QRS. So sign. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, of course. Thank you. So, um, so again, it's exaggerated septal interdependence in association with tamponade physiology. Now this, now look here. This is after drainage of one liter of fluid out of the pericardial space, which is a lot. Um, and so, uh, so the septum still moves, of course, because that, um, you know, there should be some physiological variation, but, but the RV is much better filled. The right atrium is not invaginated with that effusion and it moves much less. So if you look at them side, can you start that other loop? They should both play at the same time, but you know, there we go. Yeah. So there's a side by side and you can really see how on the left, that septum skin just moved way over with the pulses paradoxes prior to drainage of the effusion and on the right, not the case. So um, I thought this was an excellent um, uh, example on echocardiography, highlighting the physiology of septal interdependence, elevated pulses paradoxus, um, and tamponade physiology with the pericardial effusion. So there you go. Um, there's, those are our EKGs for this month. Please submit any EKGs that you would have. Uh, that we can review because uh, I'd love to go through them with you and I highly invite comments because it would be most helpful for me uh, to uh, kind of work through them with you uh, so that you're uh, reading them. So, all right. Any questions on those before we move to uh, management of systolic congestive heart failure or any other questions on cases and or EKGs from the audience? All right, so let's talk about systolic heart failure. Excellent. Pretty excited about that. We have a big movement to try and decrease heart failure hospitalizations. So this is a, you know, sort of a timely topic. Um, and uh, there is a lot of extremely effective therapy for systolic heart failure. So uh, I'm glad that this topic came up. So my general outline, I'm going to talk um, first about what heart failure is and is not, give you a classification schema for heart failure in general, and then I'm going to talk about, because you could talk for a week about management of heart failure. Um, I mean, literally, the word review courses are a week long. Um, <laughs> and they're filled every day with discussion of management and evaluation and all these things. So today, I am going to talk about the management of stable or compensated, not decompensated, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or systolic heart failure. So first off, 
This is from the guidelines. What is heart failure? Heart failure is a complex clini clinical syndrome, not an echocardiographic diagnosis, not an echocardiographic diagnosis, resulting from structural or functional impairment of ventricular filling. That would be heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. But also if there is, by definition, a filling defect with systolic heart failure or ejection of blood. So you de diminish left ventricular ejection fraction or right ventricular ejection fraction. The cardinal manifestations of heart failure are dyspnea and fatigue, which may limit exercise tolerance and or fluid retention, which may, may be manifest as pulmonary edema, uh, splanchnic congestion. So many people will tell you they you know, just have this bloating of their abdomen when they gain fluid, and they don't actually get tremendous peripheral edema. And of course, the easiest thing is you push on their leg, and uh, you push in two centimeters, and there's just a tremendous edema. Uh, and of course, uh, that is um, provocative of potential heart failure. But more importantly, what is not heart failure? Heart failure is not fluid retention in the setting of hypoalbuminemia or anemia. So remember that fluid movement across a semi permeable membrane depends on oncotic pressure inside and outside on both sides of the membrane, uh, and, uh, and then just regular pressure uh, on both sides of the membrane. So if you lose intravascular oncotic pressure, then you fill your tissues and you get often edematous. Um, so it's not fluid retention related to renal disease, so we often will see the diagnosis of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction in somebody who, um, you know, just can't quite uh, get all the fluid off during dialysis, for example. It's not primary pulmonary hypertension, and it's not pulmonary hypertension for, you know, secondary to lung diseases, lung disease. So um, in conjunction with that, and often in the evaluation of heart failure, we'll check a B-type natriuretic peptide. B-type natriuretic peptide, comes from the left ventricular myocardium as a response to myocardial stretch. And so you can measure it in general, a value greater than 400 nanograms per milliliter, picograms per milliliter that is, picograms per milliliter, is indicative of heart failure, but it can be elevated in some of the same things that I was just talking about, some of these non-heart failure uh, things such as renal failure, anemia, pulmonary disease, critical illness, sepsis, burns, and many, many other things. So, um, so you know, when in doubt, get a cardiologist involved, seek some advice, never carry a casket alone. But, um, but there are a lot of reasons other than heart failure to have lower extremity edema, especially. I'd like to point something out here. Yeah. BNP normal um, per lab is 100, but there's a lot of our older patients that are above 100 all the time. Yeah. So that's what you see in advancing age. And I think you mentioned 400 or above would be generally, considered. Generally, generally, yeah, yeah. Would be considered so, elevated. And of course it can be falsely negative in the setting of obesity. And there's a lot of ins and outs in the evaluation process. Um, so you kind of have to look at the global picture um, here. So let's talk about classification of heart failure in general. So a lot of times, and for most clinicians, even cardiologists, we often talk about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which is HEFPEF or diastolic heart failure, and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So reduced ejection fraction is defined as an ejection fraction of 40% or less, even um, uh, you know, after therapy, after maximal medical therapy. Um, a preserved ejection fraction is more than 50%. So if you medically manage them um, and their EF comes back up to 50 or more, then that's half PEF, but I often will qualify that as with previously reduced ejection fraction, et cetera. And then, there's this emerging recognition amongst the heart failure community of heart failure with borderline ejection fraction. That's an EF, a left ventricular ejection fraction of 41 to 49%. And we're really learning more about those people in general. They're treated as HEF-PEF, uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, but 
there's a lot of nuances there. Um, so we're going to keep it clean for today, and we'll go with the easiest group, most uh, uh, responsive to medical therapy, which is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Okay. So again, this is the idea of heart failure with uh, preserved ejection fraction that improved um, quote, more than 40% as I was alluding to. Okay, so this is a super busy slide, sorry. It's for reference. Uh, but when you uh, categorize heart failure, there are stages and functional classification. And so if you look at the ACC stages, A and B is no real manifest heart failure. So A is somebody who's got um, high blood pressure or a bunch of other risk factors, um, but a structurally normal heart, as far as you can tell. B is maybe the person who has, um, who has sustained an MI and their EF is uh, 45 or 50, um, but they um, have no overt manifestations of heart failure, only ischemic coronary disease. C is what we consider heart failure. C is everybody um, you know, who has the clinical syndrome of heart failure, and D is you've got them on everything you can, but you can't keep them out of the hospital, and they're just um, you know, doing very poorly, basically in the process of dying. So that's, AB, that's the ACC AHA stages. And then the New York Heart Association functional classification um, subcategorizes basically ACC stage C, because this is just real heart failure. And so NYHA1 is they have no limitation. Two is they have a little limitation, but they can get up two flights of stairs. Three is they can do some exertion, but they cannot get up a couple of flights of stairs before they get experience symptoms. So they have symptoms with you know, minimal exertion, but they do not have symptoms at rest. And four uh, is um, they have symptoms even at rest, even at rest. So this sort of kind of loosely follows the ASA classification. Um, so, uh, you know, if you sort of substitute in here NYHA, so four is rest symptoms, three is can't get up two flights of stairs, two flights of stairs. Uh, two is I can get up a couple, but then I'm just super winded. And one is I'm just, uh, you know, I, I can exert myself with minimal limitation, just kind of like a normal person. So, um, so those are the stages. And so again, you know, there's some things that you do to prevent the onset of overt heart failure for these other situations, but I'm not, we're not going to get into that. We're going to, again, keep it clean and move to the right if we can. And we are going to talk about overt heart failure, which is ACC stage C, and we're going to talk about heart failure with reduced ejection fraction um, and the the medical management of that, okay? So we're not talking about preserved, we're talking about reduced and the medical management of that. So we're gonna focus on this one part of the algorithm, uh, but all stages and um, therapies are in this slide for reference. Uh, um, and of course, I'm happy to talk about that at any time. So here we go. So medical management of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. I'll just, just to review a little bit, um, if they have stage A, control their blood pressure, get them to lose weight, stop smoking. I mean, do all the things that you do for patients, um, of course. That's for A and B. Um, now, uh, stage C, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. These are, and I'm going to go through each one, the, uh, man the tools of management in the treatment of this. So diuretics. If they're congested, decongest them. Um, ACE inhibitors and ARBs, aldosterone antagonists. Not every beta blocker is appropriate for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. You've got to try to switch them to one that has mortality benefit. And then in some populations, hydralazine and isodil, digoxin, defibrillators, and then there's a couple more new 2017 guideline updates that I'll give at the very end. Um, so here we go, one at a time. Diuretics. Again, for reference, there's numerous diuretics. Most people will start off with 40 once or twice a day of Lasix, but there's so many other options. And I have, again, from the guidelines listed out all of them, 
uh, including their initial doses, their maximum doses, and their uh, half-life. So um, the loop diuretics are typically where people will start. And so, for example, um, you know, uncomplicated person, a little bit congested, uh, naive, I put them on some Lasix, 20 or 40 milligrams once or twice a day. And then if you've had them on Lasix for a long time, you may need to amplify the effects of that with a thiazide diuretic, chlorothalidone, chlorothiazide, hydrochlorothiazide, um, metolazone, you know, all those things will amplify because as you, um, as you inhibit the loop of Henle, you start to concentrate more distally your sodium to retain it, and the thiazide diuretics will act on the more distal nephron in order to eliminate it. We can go into those mechanisms, but at least for to get to get through an overview of the you know multiple managements of uh, systolic heart failure, I'll just put those out there um, as tools at your disposal. And I will say, and this I think is very important, that if you uh, really well medically manage a person with systolic heart failure, it's, you can frequently, or, or at least at times, get them off of their diuretics once you get them on other heart failure therapy. Um, so you can try to come off of those because many people just uh, really have a hard time with the polyuria and frequency and urgency associated with diuretics. So, ACE inhibitors and ARBs, these are really important. Um, huge mortality benefit, there's multiple options, but I will say that um, the study ACE inhibitors are not that many, enalapril and lisinopril, and then captopril. Captopril is used three times a day, I use it in the hospital, to um, initiate an ACE inhibitor, or rarely I'll use it in the clinic um, if I'm worried about maybe renal function or something. I'll put them on it for a few days so I know that they, I can get them up to uh, pharma, uh, basically um, up to blood levels as far as pharmacology, and then I'll check their chemistry panel just a few days later um, to make sure I'm not hurting them with that, and then I'll convert them to a longer acting ACE inhibitor such as lisinopril. Um, and so then you can see also, I think very important from the guidelines are the um, doses achieved in trial data. So it takes, you know, kind of a lot of medicine to do a lot of good for these people. So it is strong medicine. And then of course, if, for example, they have a cough or something, then you switch them to an ARB. Candesartan, Losartan, and Valsartan have all been studied. They're all very useful, and the initial doses, maximum dosage, and average trial doses of all these medicines that are tools at your disposal are there for reference, and I would encourage you to get comfortable with one or two of them and reference the rest as needed. So, um, okay, so ACE inhibitors, ARBs, then aldosterone antagonists, also mortality benefit. This is pretty easy, there's two. There's spironolactone, which is cheap and sometimes causes gynecomastia. And then there's a plurinone, which is expensive and doesn't cause gynecomastia. So, you know, um, if your drug rep brings you lunch, then use a plurinone. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Don't do that. So I often use spironolactone. I think a plurinone is very nice, but there are very few patients um, who are too concerned about gynecomastia. And it, it re it's pretty rare in my experience giving a lot of spironolactone. So, um, and heart failure beta blockers. So ACE and ARB, aldosterone antagonist, and heart failure beta blocker, that's your core, really good, very evidence-based, a lot of mortality benefit and improvement in left ventricular ejection fraction management, and I would use them in that order. Um, because of the effectiveness and utility. So it's not every beta blocker that has mortality benefit in, uh, in systolic heart failure. Bisoprolol, by the guidelines. Car carvedilol, long or short acting. They lump the long acting in, though it's unstudied, 
In the studies, it was the short-acting Coreg, and you can see the average strength was it's 37.5. That's what they get people on because it's going to be 3.125, 6.25, 12.5, 25.50. And so anyways, um, so that's the average dose in trial patients. And then the toprolol succinate, long-acting, toprol, not tartrate. So although you may start with tartrate and you may use it tartrate to titrate, when they are stable, you want to get them on that long-acting metoprolol succinate. And uh, I usually will start them at 25, depending on where they are, um, and then move them up from there. Um, and core again, you have to look at their beginning blood pressure and how they're doing and things like that. Do not add a beta blocker when they're decompensated. You will further decompensate them, especially if their heart, if their ejection fraction is severely reduced. That is the next level of therapy. So uh, it is class three to add a beta blocker when they are decompensated can cause harm, just so you know. But definitely um, for the stable compensated person has mortality benefit. So, okay, now hydralazine isardil, basically in African Americans, uh, it's a uh, very class one level of evidence A, to add hydralazine or isardil, perhaps in place of, or in addition to an ACE inhibitor. And then, um, you know, there's other things, uh, loop diuretics, aldosterone antagonists, you know, in the right patient situation, but those should be there probably anyways. And again, getting them off their loop, there's no mortality benefit of loop diuretics. It's only for symptoms, but you know, you can't, um, you can't just let them uh, live underwater, so you got to use it um, if they need it. So, all right. So, uh, hydralazine isardil um, was originally the, a lot of the early trial data was with a combination, fixed combination dose called Bidel, which was taken off the market for years and is now currently available again. Um, but I typically will use hydralazine by itself. Again, this is dot. This is dose three can be four times a day. I often will back them off to twice a day because having that noon dose is just really challenging. Um, but I'll start off at 25 or 50 milligrams. This is the, you know your go-to therapy. If they have renal insufficiency and you do not think that it's safe to give them an ACE inhibitor, then hydralazine is excellent and isardil um, as a vasodilator. And I would use generally try and use that there's some um, concern for um, um, oxidative stress with hydralazine alone, and so that um, I would use them together, and that's what the guidelines say in gym. In gym. Um, okay, digoxin, you know, uh, has been around for a long, long time, can decrease heart failure hospitalizations, is also in many studies shown to be an independent risk factor for death, so be careful. If your digoxin level, when you check it, is greater than 1.2, my recommendation would be to back them off. Digoxin levels went out of vote for a long time because digoxin can become toxic even at normal levels. Um, and of course, you're gonna have those color changes, nausea, and all the things that go along with that, um, related to which I generally avoid the 250 microgram dose. I generally give them the 125 microgram dose. But if their level is not above 1.2, recent studies even published within the last several months have shown that it's probably safe and they may actually uh, benefit. Um, and the main benefit is to decrease heart failure hospitalizations. And to be fair, we have newer expensive therapy that can do the same thing the same way. And so I'll talk about that in just a moment. Now, defibrillator. If you have a patient who has systolic heart failure, and they have not had a myocardial infarction in the last 40 days, you have them on maximal medical therapy, and their left ventricular ejection fraction remains at 35% or less, then it's a class one level of evidence A, indication for implantation of a defibrillator. Okay, so there's some, a little bit of controversy about non-ischemic cardiomyopathy based on some recent trial data published in the New England Journal of Medicine. The guidelines have not changed. 
Um, so uh, submit those people for consideration for defibrillator implantation, especially if they're not using meth and they're you know doing all the right stuff and so on. If they're using meth or other things and not taking their medicine or things like that. They're probably going to get turned down. Um, you know, so, uh, but outside of those extenuating circumstances, submit for consideration for defibrillator implantation. Now, if they, if you're going to put a defibrillator in and they have a left bundle branch block with a QRS duration more than 150 milliseconds, then they should, they have a um, class one level of evidence A or B, depending on which way you cut it. Um, how where their symptoms are uh, indication for a biventricular pacer so a dual chamber would be right atrium right ventricle and a biventricular would be right ventricle and left ventricle left ventricle so uh, we put that in through the coronary sinus and then you get uh, more sequential activation and uh, um, better uh, left ventricular ejection fraction more synchronous and that often protects their kidneys and may uh, improve their functional class. And uh, people seem in that situation do very well with that intervention. Okay, so now I'm just briefly gonna go into the 2017 guidelines. Very busy slide again. I'm gonna um, focus on two things because everything else you've heard, and these are new therapies from the 2017 guidelines based on the evidence. And what this says is that. If you have a New York Heart Association functional class two or three heart failure patient who has adequate blood pressure, and that's the key, on an ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker, consider discontinuation of their ACE or ARB in place of an angiotensin receptor natriuretic, in, natriuretic peptide inhibitor. Basically, that's Entresto. So if you have them on lisinopril or losartan um, or whatever, and their blood pressure is 120 or 130, uh, then you can consider uh, putting them on Entresto. It's very expensive. Um, it does have mortality benefit. It, it's a good medicine. Um, it helps with uh, you know, fluid metabolism and heart failure. Um, and so, um, so uh, the doses are 24, 26, 49, 51, and 97, 101. Anyways, these are just three doses, and I usually start them on the lowest one and then move them up uh, if I decide that this is a person who you know, really could benefit and will afford that medicine and things like that. So that's Entresto, so mortality benefit. And then the only other change in the 2017, up, I mean the other, the important change that I'll review is that in the same functional class of patients who are in sinus rhythm with a heart rate more than 70 beats per minute on maximally tolerated beta blocker therapy, you can consider ivabradine or Corlinor, which is a funny channel inhibitor, um, to prevent hospitalization. So this is modern DIG. The modern DIG is Corlinor. Um, and it's good stuff, it's expensive therapy, and it keeps people out of the hospital. So, you know, these are some things that, this is, this is really icing the cake if you're at that stage. I mean, I would certainly applaud you because most cardiologists don't get to the point of that. And it is expensive therapy, and it does help some people, but, you know, you have to be selective in these such cases. So, anyways, that covers basically the management of systolic heart failure. Um, and so those are the, all the key high points. I'm happy to take any questions because as I said, there's just so many little caveats to this, but it's very important. These people are very ill. They have high mortality um, and we want to help them to not die. I mean, this is really important stuff. So I'll take questions or comments. Um, so. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand and I can take you off mute or unmute yourself with the iPod in the lower left corner of your screen. I'd like to bring a point. Oh, wait, we have one. Oh, we have a question. Okay. Yeah. Hello. Uh, Adam Zawahi, coenzyme Q10, or better yet, ubiquinone. 
right? For the management of systolic heart failure, no benefit. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I would say um, if you are in ACC stage uh, A or B heart failure for uh, with an ischemic etiology, and you're adding a um, uh, a uh, hydrophilic uh, statin, that I think that can be useful in such a case. But in the in the general systolic heart failure, the guidelines do not advocate for that as um, uh, you know a therapy with mortality benefit. Thanks. Yeah. Hello, I have a question. Yeah, please. Hi, this is Dr. Altamimi. Um, I have a question about the guidelines uh, in regard to the age of the patients that applies these guidelines. Yes. Go ahead. So, um, is there a limit for the age? Because I'm a geriatrician, I see a lot of older patients who have heart failure. They are in digoxin and they are in Lasix and they have side effects including lightheadedness, dizziness, falls, uh, and I'm wondering uh, these guidelines for geriatric population. Yes, so I think that more importantly, I think age is an extremely important um, a factor to take into account, but also, in, I think almost as or more important is their comorbidity status, and there are various models um, for the uh, prediction of mortality in such patients. And so if I had an older patient, then Lasix and Dig would be my last choices. I would definitely pursue ACE, ARB, aldosterone antagonist, and maybe a beta blocker because you're talking about two of the therapies with the highest, uh, you know, burden in terms of uh, polyuria in the case and frequency in the case of the uh, diuretic and more to end independent risk for mortality in the case of digoxin. And so you really want to get them on better therapy um, so you can eliminate those more dangerous medicines. But I often uh, will have end of life conversations with my heart failure patients as they're, you know, what, where are we at? This is a significant comorbidity that's going to limit your longevity. You need to have that conversation. So, okay, thank you. Online tools, risk calculators. All right, everybody. Next month, I'll do heart failure with preserved ejection fraction to uh, tail onto this. So, uh, if heart failure is of interest, stay tuned, um, and we will talk about that next time. Thank you for your attendance.